Ate Monde. My name is Anna. I'm a user experience and design consultant in Google. I hope you're all enjoying the day and obviously looking forward to the evening part. I will take you through some best practices and A-B test suggestions of things that you can test because that's my job to give you the checklist. But besides things that you can test, I will also take you through some things that you need to learn so that your A-B test is successful and also why you need to change the culture of your company in order to succeed in mobile. I'm going to start where Lena has fi finished her amazing talk and it's going to be different UX suggestions for testing. And some of the th these things we've learned from UX teams at Google and some of these things we've learned from you. Over the last four years, my team has completed more than 600 UX projects with customers in EMEA, and that's a great, great learning. So I do want to talk about all of them, but my four-hour request was declined. <laughs> but I will take you for some of them, though, and I'm going to start with a story. I was recently in London, and this is a picture that I took in one of the restaurants. These are salt and pepper shakers that they brought me. And I did want some salt in my dish, and I didn't want any pepper. And I've made an assumption that probably salt is the one with the five holes. Well, just to clarify here, at least in my culture, the salt shakers would have more holes than pepper ones. So I've made an assumption, I conducted experiment, and bam, this was pepper. <laughs> and I was like, Oh my God, this is a perfect illustration of the situation when we design things and we think that they are clear because they are clear to us, but this not maybe the case for every user. And okay, that was in London, but then I went to Dublin. <laughs> By the way, everybody welcome who is here for the first time, but that's what I've got in one of the pops. And here I had no chance to conduct the experiment. I just had to blindly do the thing and figure out where my salt is. And you know, I do travel a lot, I like traveling, and I find things very, very different. <laughs> Inconsistent. <laughs> really hard to interpret and sometimes weird. Can you guess where this one was? Japan. No, not Japan. Anybody from Amsterdam? <laughs> Have you seen these guys around? Anyway, so it's not only about the number of holes anymore, it's also about the designs that sometimes people really get caught by doing designs and they forget about the usability at all. Like for example here, this is not mine, I just found it online. One lady in Belgium collects salt and pepper shakers and I was like, wow, how crazy can people go for making things just beautiful and not usable because I would have no idea which ones of them are salt and which ones of them are pepper. So when you travel, you find yourself in these different environments and every time you need to adapt in order to get things done. And in this case scenarios, it's very useful to be able to understand how things work and to be able to recognize things and recall to them. It's like jumping from one website to another and trying to understand how things work there. So the solution to the salt and pepper mystery is probably this, right? Maybe not the best design, but definitely much better user experience. Which brings me to my first point. Call it what it does. Labels, people, where are your text labels? Whenever you have any icon on your website, do add a text label to it. Explain what's gonna happen when people click. And I know what you're all thinking. Anna, we don't have space in mobile, but users don't care. They just wanna know what's gonna happen. And regarding space, I'll tell you more. If you don't have a label and if you do have just one icon, then it's probably not large enough for, on mobile. But if you add the text label, then you increase the overall target area and then it's just much easier to tap. And just to show you, this is a learning from Google Translate team. We've done these things, we learned these things in our own products. They increase the number of engagements with features by just naming them in the UI. I guess everyone was just wondering what is that weird snake on the screenshot before? <laughs> but now everybody knows that's the handwriting feature that you can use. 
And just to conclude, the thing about the text labels, this is what I saw the other day in Google Canteen in Tel Aviv. And it really made my day. You know, I thought how much time we usually spend next to the cutlery trying to pull things out in order to figure out where the fork and where the knife is. But I thought it was genius who put these text labels there. They saved so much people's time and efforts. So are we clear about text labels? Add them. Moving on to the next real life example and to the next thing that you can do on your websites. Do you have any idea what's this? Well, besides the fact that this is a walking dead GIF, <laughs> this is a revolving door. And revolving doors, they were originally invented by, as a design solution to allow much more people in and out at the same time. However, if you are a user of a revolving door, if you are just about to enter, or if you are in there, you don't really feel good, do you? You cannot control the speed, it moves really fast, you depend on other people you are with on this wonderful journey. So revolving door re represents zero user control and a lot of anxiety. And you know what it all reminds me? animated carousels that you have right on the top of your homepage, engaging users into this wildness. And of course, this is a bad user experience because this is a forced content exploration. And we do get annoyed by animation and perceive it as ads. And even if I, if I want to read what's on the banner, it moves away from me. OK, I still need to show you an example of website just to show you how you shouldn't be doing this. But obviously, I cannot use any of yours because you guys are just all doing great. Uh, so are you ready for this? A real website. You know, that's how you shouldn't be doing this. You see the, old lo the logo up there? So, Really, as you can see, it's really difficult to get attracted by these things. And if you do want to leave these banners, just switch off the animation, put the user in control, allow this to be a user-initiated exploration because engagement is the new currency in the UX. And in this case, interactions with your banners is just going to make much more sense. <coughs> okay, so clear with carousels? Don't do them. Moving on to the next thing, and it's not mine again. A friend of mine who has his blog about his life in Ireland found this on Reddit. I'll give you a second to enjoy reading this. <laughs> so 10 items will do, 12 items will do too. And what about if I have 11? So are you leaving your customers clear or confused about what they should do? How do you phrase things? Which brings us to the next thing, a copy that you need to get right. Think about this as about, build, as about building website experience with words. And it's very, very hard, especially on mobile, because you need to keep things very short, but at the same time descriptive, easy to understand for a child, but at the same time to translate to other languages. And there are many UX copywriting rules, and you can find them all online. I will just focus on a few things that uh, you can test and a few mistakes that companies do. So one of the things that some companies do is they brag about their product or about their service, whereas in fact they should be speaking about the user and what the better version of themselves the user is going to become if they use your product. Right? This is actually very basic sales training, and every good salesperson knows that. So don't forget that your users are probably not that technical. Just tell them what they can do, not what your product or what your service does. And you know, again, this is a very basic sales thing to speak about benefits and not features. And be very friendly in general. Just remind them in a nice and a conversational way what they should do in order to fix the mistake they probably didn't want to do, right? Stay in the light side. You don't need that kind of negativity in your life. Nobody needs that. So besides the ground rules of UX copywriting, what are the key tests that you can run with the copy? So one of them, obviously, is testing the copy of your call to action text labels. And this is a case study from Google search team that I'm happy to share. They used to have a text label book a room. 
and what they thought is maybe it's just too early for the user at this stage to commit. And they changed it to check availability, and what they found was that this actually was meeting users where they were in their journey, and the, the, the number of engagements increased. The other test that you can run with a copy is testing different um, copy of the high-level navigation items, including category names. Edgar's is a large South African omnichannel retailer, and they tested what text label works best for the, one of the high-level categories, and they changed it from sale to deals, and actually, as a result of this A-B test, the final conversion decreased by minus 35%. So they changed it back to sale, and it was very good that they conducted this test and they saw these results themselves. <coughs> so even such a small thing as a copy of a name of a high-level category can affect the final conversion. And the last but not least, a test that you should be constantly doing with the copy is testing your value propositions. So kissmia.com is a dating service, and they wanted to test what message works best for people who come to their website for the first time and the action for them to register an account. So they were comparing the easy way to find your love, the serious dating, and just find your love. Can you guess which one was the best if you have not attended the conversions at Google before? Okay, so I was just gonna tell this. So the serious dating worked better than the easy way, surprise, surprise. However, the love won. At the end of the day, it's all about love and about A-B testing the copy of your value proposition. So just to conclude the section about the copy, I want to say that sometimes it's not that evident what impact the language can have on the business, and you really need to run this test in order to see things yourself. Moving on to the next thing, and I, sometimes when I travel, I rent a car. And every driver in the room here can recall a bad navigation example, like really crazy one. And navigation is a very complex area, especially on mobile. And there are a lot of things there, and I want to cover just a few things regarding mobile-first navigation and what that exactly means. Can I ask you a question? Can you spot any difference between these and these? Well, any guess? The, the bottom? Yeah, yeah, it's all this, uh, yes, exactly. The section was called navigation, so it's the position of the navigation bar. And now I'm gonna tell you that the first group is apps, and the second one is websites. So why is this happening? Apps were originally developed and designed with the mobile first and mobile only user in mind, whereas websites, they usually get this top level navigation as a legacy from desktop. The question is, if and when all websites will have the bottom level navigation and when users are going to be rated for this? Because actually, the bottom of the page is considered to be a more ergonomic location because if, for example, I'm holding the phone just with one hand, I don't need to change the way I hold it in order to interact with the panel. So again, the point here is it is a good idea for mobile in general but you need to test it for websites specifically because users may not just be ready for this change yet. They may not be yet ready to recognize websites. This is a great learning from Matalan, a British fashion homeware retailer. They were testing whether an app-like navigation bar placed on the bottom is going to increase engagement. An A-B test revealed surprising results. They did get more engagements with the basket, which was a good thing. However, the number of engagements with other elements in the panel has decreased, and they didn't want this, and they returned the navigation panel to the original position on the top. So as with everything that we discuss here today, do test these things. 
What else about navigation? What else can you put in the bottom? Well, call to action is a part of the navigation, and if you do have just one thing you want people to complete on the page, it is a good idea to test a call to action being sticky on the bottom, right? And again, this is a very good solution where you don't duplicate the call to action multiple times per page. This is the way people are always aware of what is that thing that they need to do now. And again, it's very easy to tap in mobile. And if you do want people to click on just one thing, to do one thing, then sometimes it's actually a good idea to limit the navigation. And I'm going to refer, to refer here to famous rule of noise. When it comes to checkout, you limit all exit points. You limit the navigation so that it doesn't distract the user and they can concentrate on the task they need to complete. Does anybody in the room speak Russian? Okay, I can see a few people. So if you do, you can confirm that this is a basket page. This is a basket page, the before and after of a large consumer electronics retailer in video. And as you can see, even if you don't understand Russian, they completely redesigned their basket page. They removed the noise. They completely removed the top level navigation panel, including the hamburger button, search, and the basket icon. And in general, they implemented a bit cleaner design. So overall, they've got, just from this A-B test, they've got high final conversions and high average order value. So just to remember these key things about the navigation, do test mobile first navigation, including the navigation panels on the bottom and sticky call to actions on the bottom. And if users are really ready to convert, you may consider removing all um, just uh, all other navigation items besides the key call to action, like next. Next thing, and I don't have a real life example for you, unfortunately, but let's speak about landing pages. You probably heard of this rule of three elements that on any landing page, any home page, it is a good thing to have three things a call to action, a value proposition, and sometimes, depending on the industry, some visuals, right? So it looks like these guys got all three elements. So are they doing all right? Is there still anything wrong that you can spot? Well, does this page continue? I don't know. Well, probably it doesn't because I just don't see anything below there. But it does, and they have some benefits of signing up for Google Ads there. Very important information, very well written, but nobody is ever going to read it because people will have no idea they need to scroll down. Which brings us to the next point, breaking the fold, designing the layout, designing the above the fold space in a way that users are clear they need to scroll down in order to see more. This is a case study from 100 rooms a vacation search aggregator in Spain. They redesigned their hotel listing page in a way that, first of all, they broke the fold, right? So that from the first moment when I land there, it's absolutely clear that this is a hotel listing page and not a page with just one hotel option. And the second thing that they did, remember what we discussed earlier about not rushing the user into commitment just yet? They removed the call to action reserve with TripAdvisor because they realized it's just too early to make this decision for users from the product listing page. And they changed it to view offer and add to favorites. As a result of all these changes, the conversion rate decreased, increased by more than 50%. Okay. Forms are going to be the last thing I'm going to speak about in the test part. And Lena spoke earlier about checkout. And when it comes to checkout, then forms should be really nice, short, and very simple because they are the last obstacle that people are faced on the way to the purchase. However, if you have forms somewhere up the funnel, for example, on your landing page, then really short forms asking for very personal information like user's email address may just freak people out. And what you can do, what you can try if you're, for example, a lead gen company and uh, you have forms on your landings, you can experiment with so-called breadcrumbs technique. 
So the breadcrumbs technique is when you actually increase the number of fields, but you break the form into steps. And before asking users to submit some very sensitive information like their email address or their phone number, you ask them so-called low threat questions. What are your business goals? How we can help you? What do you want to learn about our product? And after they already completed all this information and they're halfway through, you tell them, okay, now I need to just your email address to send you inf this information somewhere. And you know, it's much easier to commit than at this stage. This is a great split test from Reich. What they were, they do a project man management software and this is a desktop product and the role of mobile landings for them, pure lead generation. And they were comparing a short landing on mobile that had absolutely no navigation, simply value proposition, small form, and a call to action register. And the other landing that had much more content, and the user could access the content only after they complete a very short questionnaire on the top. They had to choose the role and they want what you want to learn about the product. And after that, the user gets redirected to a relevant section of the page. So what they found was that conversions, was, the conversion rate was higher from the first page, right? It's a very straightforward one. The only thing that you can do there is to leave your email address. However, the quality of leads that they were getting was higher from the second page. So people who engaged with the content, people who found answers to their specific questions showed much more interest in the product later on. So at the end of the day, it's not only just about conversions, it's also about the quality of the, these conversions and the quality of leads that your sales team is gonna get and the revenue of your company, right? So these are the things for the forms that you can test. Okay, we are done with the test part and this is the big checklist and you can take a picture of it right now or you will get slides at the end of the conversions at Google. So what's now? Are we done with conversion rate optimization? Is it as easy as just to go and test these things? No, and while we're working with you throughout the year, we see that there are just many things more than just testing this and we recognize it's not that easy for you and we're trying to understand what are the other areas that you're struggling with and where you need help. This is a study from the Conversion Excel that they recently published. It says, A-B testing is only 20% of conversion rate optimization process. What else is there? Okay, 20% of time you do spend on doing tests. About 20% of time, just about the same amount, you spend on looking into data, trying to analyze it and to get insights. And what is the rest 60%? What is this huge gray area? I'm gonna tell you, this is internal politics that we all need to deal with. <laughs> and you know, no, it's not that easy as just to go and test this, right? There are many more areas that we need to get right, that we need to work all together on, and hopefully during these two days, you will receive some guidance on all these areas. But let's start, let's have a quick look into the understanding the data. What are the key problems there? I'm going to stay very high level on, on this because right after me, there is the next talk by my colleague Mete, and he will take you through some common mistakes that companies do when they measure A-B tests. But what we see in general, that measurement is a real struggle. People say things like conversions and statistical significance, but they measure them differently. And you know, people see, look into data, see different things, and this is a never-ending story. In fact, you should learn statistics at your best because even highly trained statisticians make mistakes when they are interpreting data. And the reason why we're all making mistakes is because we're all humans. We're all human be beings and we have our own biases and what we want to see, we want to prove that our ideas work. We want to see our baby, our variant that we designed wins, right? 
But that's not the right approach. We need to really learn how to fail. We need to celebrate mistakes. And we need to learn from these failures because that's the only way. The point of conversion rate optimization is to learn and not to win, not to, prov not to prove your own ideas are great. So do learn statistics as much as you can. Become the best in the industry because that's the only way. However, try at the same time to stay humble and really be aware of your own bias and how your bias is affecting the process. Try to learn how to celebrate failed A-B test because if the A-B test fails, then it was a good idea to launch this A-B test, right? So, which, and probably in order to achieve that where you constantly learn and constantly fail, you need to change your own mindset and probably a mindset of people around you, which brings us to the next thing, to people that we work with, right? We do spend a lot of time on talking to people just about 60%, the study says. And the reason why we spend so much time on talking to other people is probably because we are very inefficient in this, or we just don't agree on the basics. Well, in fact, you need to aspire to get this agile and A-B testing mentality, and the only way how you can get it is to change the culture of your organization and to change the mindset of people. When we speak to UX designers, they always agree with us. They say, well, you know, we know that's good for the user, but really, we need to have that, home, that carousel on the homepage because we also have a marketing department and they have some partnerships in place and these partnerships just have to be featured in the same way. That's why we have it there. So it looks like UX excellence is not only UX designer's job, there are a lot more stakeholders involved, and let's just have a quick look at all of them. So, in fact, in the reality, we all have different priorities, right? And that's why cross-functional collaboration is not happening. So people in UX and product may think that they are doing a great job and the product can really sell itself. Or sometimes you can have some people in product who have so-called Steve Jobs effect. They can think that it's their job to define the product vision and they will be translating their vision to everyone and not listening to feedback. Marketing may care only about quantity of leads but not the quality of leads. Customer support is not even on the slide because everybody forgets about them. Nobody includes customer support into the conversion rate optimization process, but they're actually a graveyard of feedback, of very good feedback, but they're designed just to bring a good CSAT to the C-level and not the box, right? And the C-level, well, they may not even care about conversion rate optimization, UX, mobile, unless they attend conversions at Google regularly. So how do we go about these challenges? How do we really embrace this culture where everyone speaks to everybody? Well, what we can do at the very least is to speak to each other better. Product and UX need to realize they're not necessarily voice of the user. Sales or customer support, they speak to users on a daily basis. They understand their fears needs and struggles, go and get the best salesperson in your company, sit down with them and listen. They will have very good points for you. In fact, you should become an advocate of testing an agile culture and you should sell it to your boss because with their buy-in, things are gonna get much easier in general. In fact, you should sell it to everyone in the company so this becomes a shared culture, a shared goal, right? But I know it's not that easy and you will have to start from scratch, but there is some sort of a candy for everyone there. You just need to find it out. So what are the practical things that you can do in order to achieve this? One of the practical things that you can try is try and design thinking, thinking methods because that's the way how you can achieve both, learning fast and getting everyone in the room. One of the things that we run on my team at Design Sprints, raise your hands who has attended the Google Design Sprint this year. 
okay, so not that many people. So design sprints are a methodology of applying design thinking to solving critical business problems. And you can apply it to absolutely any business problem. On my team, we are applying it to solving UI problems and to launching website changes fast. And one of the first concept of getting feedback at the very early stage before you get into production allows you to fail cheaply and with low fidelity. And the second concept of divergent and convergent thinking allows you not only to explore the new terrain, but also to build the confidence behind your team that you are doing the right thing because you ask everybody to be in the room, everybody to brainstorm, and everybody to agree on things. There is a book by Jake Knapp where you can learn more about how to run these sprints in your company. So one of the last design sprints that my team has hosted was in South Africa. And this is where we took companies for best practices of landing page design and we asked them to prototype in the afternoon. One Life, an insurance company in South Africa, they attended the sprint and within one day, they brought their agency along with, their, with an in-house team, and within one day, they developed a completely new prototype, which was very different from original landing page. So as you can see, they implemented a very short and concise form, which allowed to bring the key call to action above the fold. They implemented the value proposition in two bullet points, very nice and visual. They improved the image layout, fixed the header on the top, fixed the key call to actions in the header. So all in all, they were they said, the, we, are, we were very well aware of these best practices before, but you know, we just never got to do these things. But Design Sprint allowed them all to get together and to do this work. And as a result, the new prototype completely killed the original and they decided to launch the new landing in just about a month after the sprint. Another learning from the same sprint, Adgers is a large, fashion omnichannel retailer in South Africa. At the sprint, they redesigned their homepage, which is a huge deal for any retail company. But actually at the sprint, they sat down and they agreed that these changes were and are necessary. They removed the animated carousel, they implemented the high level categories above the fold, what Lena was also speaking earlier about. They moved the call to action above the fold too. As a result, the, the new version won the split test and they launched already the new landing. But the biggest win for Edgar specifically it was that they used to be a very traditional retailer with no sales coming from offline. However, improving their M site UX is now driving their on online sales. And what they've done, the digital team, the product team has introduced requirements to a merchandising process. In fact, they optimized the whole value chain because it was affecting the digital experience the customers had. And that's how their product, their UX team, made everybody in the company beyond digital involved and made everybody accountable into this. I want to conclude the change part with this quote. Product excellence is a culture. Unfortunately, it's not the checklist that I can share with you at the end of the chapter. And again, I will repeat that UX is not only UX designer's job. It, in fact, everybody in the company needs to be involved and to share responsibility. It's like about taking pride of the work that you do. It's about taking pride of contributing to a great product and working for a great company. And remember that salt and pepper example from London. Let's imagine designer did want Salt to be in the one with five holes, as I, as the end user, expected this. But maybe it was implementation that failed this. Maybe it was a kitchen assistant who just put salt into the wrong shaker. And you know, this all resulted in, because they just didn't connect to designer of the original idea, or because they just, just didn't care about the end customer experience that much. I don't know. So I want to conclude my presentation with a few things. First one is do check, do test these checklists that we share with you. These are very impactful things that we saw over the last four years. The next one is do learn statistics at your best 
but more importantly, learn how to be aware of your own bias, how it's affecting the process, learn how to deal with failures, and then you need to fail fast and learn fast. And in order to achieve this environment, you need to change your own mindset and the mindset around people around you. And organizational change is a very large and complex area. Nobody will give you a solution to this in five bullet points. But that's why you need to start thinking about this right now. Become advocate of testing an agile culture and make this the biggest goal for you. Thank you. My name is Anna. <laughs>